Good afternoon. Welcome to the HPFY Shop Nebulizer webinar series, Sleep Well. Um, it really is a focused on all things respiratory. And so uh, we, uh, we're glad for any that are able to uh, join us live today for our webinar. Um, also, any that are joining us on a recorded session on YouTube, we're, we're happy to have you as well. Um, this uh, series um, that we do monthly is really a, a response to our customers reaching out and explaining and expressing that uh, they have a real genuine need for um, clinical content, content that helps them uh, navigate uh, their care. Um, so um, that's really what uh, today is focused on. We have uh, Laura Castricone, our certified respiratory therapist. Uh, today, Laura is um, going to really kind of walk us through um, the world of nebulizers. Um, it's uh, really a topic that is top of mind right now with, um, you know, so many conditions that are, require the need for nebulization. So um, we'll, we'll kind of get right into it. Laura, it's good to be with you again. Thank you. It's good to see you, Justin. So, um, Laura, um, you kind of helped us chart today as far as the theme for the day. So what really is um, nebulizer treatment? So when someone needs a nebulizer treatment, what we're actually doing is we're taking a liquid medication, putting it into an apparatus that air flows through from a compressor and aerosolizes or makes that liquid medication into an aerosol so you're able to breathe it in. And the particles are broken up so small of the medication that they're able to deposit in the lower portions of the lungs to that way. And most of the medications are what we call bronchodilators. So they actually increase the caliber of the airway and open up the small airway sacs. So a nebulizer treatment, also known as a breathing treatment, a lot of people call them breathing treatments, uh, is usually using um, some sort of medication. You can either take it via a nebulizer or we also have people that use inhalers or MDIs, weird dose inhalers. And they're something that you can take and they're portable so you can take them to go. Nice. So. Um, now that we kind of understand what uh, what nebulizer treatment is, who who requires it? Who needs to to be on a nebulizer? Well, most of the population usually it's driven by your disease. So the majority of patients that we see that need nebulized medications have what's called COPD or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, and under that umbrella are three main disease states. The first one is emphysema, which most people get from smoking. Um, that's like 98% of the, the population get it from smoking if they have emphysema or being exposed to chemicals, smokes, and things like that on a daily basis, or even fumes. We've seen people that are exposed to diesel and gas fumes actually in the PD as well. Asthma is another big one, and that's what we're seeing a lot of now, especially with this in Connecticut. The air is very heavy and dense with humidity. And when the air is heavy and dense with humidity, it not only is heavier, harder to breathe, but it contains more particulate matter. So there's a lot of smoke in the air right now and pollutions that we don't see. So people that have asthma, emphysema, or the other disease state that's under COPD is chronic bronchitis. And that's something that produces a lot of phlegm. It's usually secondary to a respiratory infection as well. We also have people that have what we call cystic fibrosis, which is um, a disease that's usually inherited. Um, it's a disease usually of youth, and um, it causes the airway to produce a lot of mucus and to narrow. So a lot of times those patients will use bronchodilators as well as other adjunct therapies such as oxygen. We have a vest that beats against their chest to kind of break up some of that mucus ingestion. Um, and the other patients that need it usually have are post pneumonia. And that's what we're seeing a lot of with the COVID patients that's going home and being asked to use a nebulizer once they're reduced from the hospital or if they've been exposed to it. And it given them a lot of airway problems, a lot of times they'll be given a nebulizer to keep that airway open. And that's basically what the bronchodilator does is it dilates the airway. There are a couple other drugs that they use in it. Medications such as mucolytics, which are something to thin out the mucus. So if somebody has very thick, thick mucus that they can't cough up, and we see that a lot with cystic fibrosis, then um, they usually are given a mucolytic as well to help thin out that um, thick mucus. But most of the disease states um, are COPD, which has got the asthma, the emphysema, and the chronic bronchitis, 
our cystic fibrosis patients, post pneumonia, and a few other diseases. But just to let you know, with pneumonia, if you are a Medicare patient in this country, in the United States, Medicare pays for medication that's used through a nebulizer, through a compressor, but they won't pay for a meter dose inhaler a lot of times. So a lot of times I'll encourage patients to get nebulizer treatments because it's one thing where the medication at least is covered for that. But unfortunately, pneumonia is not in their diagnostic coding for them to pay for it. So we see a lot of patients that need nebulizer treatments that have pneumonia, but the cost is not being absorbed by their insurance. Yeah. And that's really where uh, health products for you, Shop Nebulizer, we can right. come in, um, assist in, in getting those for, uh, for customers. So, so um, that's very helpful to, for us to kind of understand the, the whole um, need for nebulizers. So some confusion though, sometimes we get questions from, from, from our customers calling in. And one of the things they, they're trying to understand is the difference between a neb and an inhaler. So can you help us with that difference? Sure. So a nebulizer, as I said, you, you're using a liquid medication and aerosolizing it. With a meter dose inhaler or an inhaler, as we call them, it's a little canister of medication that's already been broken down to small particles and they use a propellant in it and you would shake it up and you have to have good technique. You would release the medication and inhale it. The difference between the two as far as medication is negligible. It's the same medication. If you're using albuterol in a nebulizer, they can give you also albuterol in an inhaler. The difference is, first of all, nebulizer treatment is passive. You can put that mouthpiece in your mouth or the mask on your face and just breathe on it. With an inhaler, you have to have very good technique because remember, you have to actuate that canister of medication and inhale at the same time to get most of it in your airway. And we find that a lot of patients have poor technique with a, with a meter dose inhaler and a lot of the medication ends up in the back of their throat or on the back of their tongue. And that's not very helpful to the patient. So we see them abuse their meter dose inhalers because most of the medication is not getting deposited into the lungs. So what I do encourage patients to do is doesn't mean you shouldn't have an inhaler. Inhalers are great because they're portable. They don't require electricity or a battery to operate. You could throw it in your pocket or your purse or in your car and have it in case of an emergency. They're great if you have children to keep at school and things like that. But like I said, technique is everything with a meter dose inhaler. Um, they're both great. But my preference, if you're having a chronic problem or even an acute problem, would be to use a nebulizer because we know you're going to get all that medication just breathing on the treatment. The particles are nice and small. They're going to go nice and deep into your lungs. And you're going to, that's the gold standard of treatment. With the inhaler, it's kind of a, even though it's the same amount of medication, we're not sure how much you're actually getting because not a lot of it is actually getting into the airway. But yeah, so. I encourage patients, if they can, to get both. Use your nebulizer when you're home, the compressor, and then take your meter dose inhaler with you on the go in case you're you know, out walking and you have dense air like today and you're having a problem. We also call that a rescue inhaler that you could take. Yeah, so, so, so many options. And again, with nebulizers being an affordable um, option as well, it's, it's a nice standard of care that is easily accessible to all of us. So that's... The other thing I want to mention, too, is that PARI makes a nebulizer kit that's reusable. So mm -hmm. for our patients that are concerned about disposables or for our Medicare patients, a lot of times those are covered. So the PARI nebulizer, it, what's nice about that, especially for pediatrics, is it nebulizes a lot more quickly. Um, you still get the benefit of a nebulizer, but you're not sitting there for 10 minutes. You're only sitting there for maybe five minutes. So it cuts the time down in half that it takes the treatment to uh, use. And then you can also put it in the top rack of the dishwasher to wash it, which is huge because we want to keep it clean. Yeah, yeah. So um, we we may have some that are attending or going to be watching that that are, a, they, they have a nebulizer compressor, they, they have a system set and ready to go. Um, how often should those parts that they, that are on the unit um, because the, the units are durable, they're going to last a good, a good long time. But what about the parts? How often should those be replaced? So the, generally speaking, a lot of this is driven by the governing bodies that watch over hospitals and 
Medicare and how they supply things. The general consensus is that you should replace your, your nebulizer medicine cup every, every two weeks. Now, that doesn't mean you should be using the same one every two weeks. I advise patients to have at least two so they could be washing one and have one be washed while they're using another. So they always have a clean one ready. Um, otherwise, it needs to be laundry, you know, washed in between each treatment. And I always advise patients never to, to try to dry it because you can leave paper fibers or towel fibers in there and you'll inhale them on your next treatment. Um, the tubing that comes along with the nebulizer kit comes with it. And I advise patients to throw out their old one and put a new one in. One thing we should not do is you don't need to wash that connecting tubing. Remember the airflow comes out of the compressor and goes into the nebulizer. So nothing's getting back and shouldn't have any bacteria in it. And washing it can cause you to grow some mold in there because the water doesn't come out. So the nebulizer kit with the tubing, the mouthpiece or the mask, whichever way you're using it should be replaced every two weeks. Uh, the, the filter in there, that's kind of a, that's that could be every month. It depends on the condition of the home. I've seen the filters that go inside the nebulizer compressors last months and i've seen in houses where there's a fireplace being used or people smoking that that filter gets used up really quickly so i always advise patients if they can when they purchase their nebulizer supplies to get some extra filters because it's inevitable that all of a sudden you check and it's dirty and then now you got to wait for one to come and it, the reason that you want to change that too is it will make that compressor overheat because mm. the airflow can't properly go through the, the machine. And they're meant to be durable. They're meant to last a, a while. So every two weeks you should change your kit with your tubing, the mouthpiece and the mask, and then your filters. I can't say for certain, but it's usually monthly with most house, households, but it could be more frequently or less frequently depending on the, the tidiness of the home. Yeah, okay, um, that, that's really helpful. Um, you know, helps us to understand like the, the maintenance and care and mm -hmm. goes along with it. Now, before I ask you the last question to all of our attendees, again, we're, we're ecstatic that you're here with us today. We hope that uh, these uh, webinars are, are of help to you and of assistance. Um, one, um, one thing in a few moments here, we're going to have an opportunity. If you have any questions with regard to respiratory, um, that could be um, sleep or, or um, oxygen. Um, your use of CPAP, the use of a nebulizer. If you have any questions um, that maybe you have some, that you're facing some challenges with your care on, um, please use the um, Q&A section and we'll, we'll, go, we'll go through those and we'll have Laura answer any of those questions. And um, we, we wanna be a resource for you. Um, so any questions that you have, please feel free to use that Q&A section. Now, Laura, just kind of to wrap up, we're, we uh, really appreciated this time talking about nebulizers. Do you have any particular tips that stand out for uh, nebulizer patients? Yeah, so basically, first and foremost is make sure you use your medication as, as it's prescribed by your physician. And when you're in, if you're in doubt, call the pharmacy about how often you're supposed to take it or call your physician. Usually you could probably reach the pharmacy easier and they'll explain to you the directions. But if you're really concerned about the medication and what it's supposed to do, have a conversation with your medical, your medical provider. It's nice to understand what your medications do as well. Is it, am I supposed to feel less short of breath? Is my wheezing supposed to stop when I take this? What am I supposed to feel? Am I supposed to be coughing up mucus? This much mucus is supposed to come up. Those are questions you can ask the provider as well. But it also will tell you on your medication box what to expect from that medication and what it's to do. The other thing is you should never share your medication, obviously, with other patients um, because we don't know. Even though most medications used in nebulizer, we give to pediatrics, we give to babies, newborns. We don't know if somebody has a cardiac problem and it might disturb their heart rhythm. You don't want to be giving medications like anything else to, to someone that doesn't shouldn't have them. Um, nebulizer medications usually are not refrigerated, except for possibly the mucolytics, but they will tell you that on the box. But make sure you don't keep them in a window or any place that's very warm, like on top of your refrigerator where the heat's generated. It can degrade the, um, the actual medication and never put it in a window. Sunlight, that's why a lot of times they'll say keep it in the box so that way the sunlight can't get at it because that does degrade the, uh, that as well. Um, if you're using a, an oral steroid, a lot of patients will use 
inhaled steroids or in addition to their bronchial dilator. And what the steroid does is it reduces, just like a steroid you take orally, it reduces inflammation in the airway, except it's topical and it works pretty quickly. But the big thing with steroids is they have a secondary effect where they can cause either oral thrush or um, a fungal infection in the mouth. Um, so it's very important if you're using a steroid to rinse your mouth really well after you use it. Um, and, and possibly if you can brush your teeth, that's even good too. But rinsing your mouth will get rid of any of that residual medication that might be in there that might cause so many, any kind of sores in your mouth. It's very painful to have oral thrush and you don't want to eat if you have it. So it's, it's not a good thing to have. Um, make sure you have extra neb kits and filters. I always encourage patients, the last thing you want to do, especially with supply chain issues now that we're seeing is make sure you, you're stocked up on things that you need. If for some reason you can't get another nap kit, just make sure you can still utilize yours. The center stem where the, where the compressed air comes up does get clogged with medications sometimes, and you might have to get like a, a needle or something. If, and I'm talking about if you can't replace your kit, to so just poke that out to make sure you have a free passage there. You should be able to get kits through HPFY without a problem. But like I said, supply chain, I don't know. You know, sometimes we, we get kind of tied up on things. The other thing too is patients have a tendency to stop taking their nebulized or inhaled medication as soon as they feel better. Have a conversation with your physician. If you have a chronic illness, this might be something you have to do every day for the rest of your life. Steroid inhalation is usually twice a day, once in the morning, once at night, and that may be for the duration of your disease, as well as your rescue inhaler. I can't discern that. Your physician has to. And if you decide to stop, all that good work that you've been doing and putting into keeping your airway nice and open is going to start going backwards and you might end up in the hospital. So don't stop using your inhaled medication unless you have a conversation with your medical provider to make sure that it's okay to stop using it. Um, keep your stuff clean. Wash it every day. Um, bacteria. And like I said, medication can clog up that little um, nebulizer cup. And if you're only changing it every two weeks, you're not going to get your full benefit of your medication. Uh, wash the mouthpiece that goes in your mouth, it's in your mouth. So um, you want to use some just plain soap and water from, you know, you can use Dawn or, but just rinse well and leave it upside down on a paper towel and just let it air dry. Or in the case of a pari, you can put it in your top rack of the dishwasher. Yeah. I'm trying to see here if I have anything else. Um, in tips for today, stay in air conditioning. In Connecticut right now, it's 90 degrees, but it feels like it's 97. It's very heavy, moisture-laden air, which is full of pollutants and everything else. And it's very hard to breathe when you go outside. So our recommendation for patients that have any kind of um, respiratory disease is on days like this, stay inside and stay in air conditioning if you can. Thank you, Lauren. That... Um with your experience and seeing so many patients over so so such a long period of time, it's super helpful for all of us to really uh, appreciate and uh, benefit. One last, one last tip that I thought of. Um, we, this is something we used to encourage. If patients are taking their treatments m more frequently than this order, so in other words, the doctor orders it every four to six hours, but you find that you need to take it every two hours because you can't breathe, that's inappropriate. That means that you need to call up your doctor or you may have to go to the emergency room. If you're needing treatments that frequently, pretty soon it's gonna to get to the point where they're not gonna work at all and you need to get some medication on board that they have at the emergency room. So if you find that that's happening, that's a call to your doc. Okay. Keep that in mind. Well, Laura, thank you again. We do have a number of questions. So we're gonna okay. we're gonna answer these live. Um, so everybody hang on. If you've asked a question, we're gonna, Laura's gonna to get to you here. Uh, Brian asked this, Laura, can you recommend any homeopathic options for nebulizing prior to sleep for general sinus, lung, sleep health? I suffer from new daily headaches and have a damaged lung from an infection. So um, you have any recommendations uh, for- Well, I'm, I'm trying to, Brian, if you have some sort of sleep issue that, could, that may explain besides your sinuses, your headache, because we know that patients that don't, that have sleep apnea or a form of sleep apnea may wake up with morning headaches. So if that's going on every morning, that's a conversation to have with your physician. The only thing you can actually nebulize without is, is saline, which is salt water. It comes, it, it has to be sterile. You buy it at the pharmacy, but all that does is thin out mucus. Now, as far as 
sinuses go, I can't recommend anything. You know, they have the, the neti pots and stuff like that, but be careful because the same bacteria that grows in lakes that people get that amoeboid in there, you can get that in your sinus cavity from a neti pot that's not been cleaned properly. I would die, I would stay away from those if I, if, if I were you. Talk to your doctor, they have irrigation that they can recommend for you, but there is a saline spray it's called Ocean, or all it is, and it it's over the counter. You can buy it in CVS or any drugstore. And that's a good spray to spray up your nose. It's a saline. And what it does is it clears out the passages. And I would also use a nasal strip. If you're having a hard time breathing at night, try those nasal strips. They are nasal dilators. They open the passages just enough sometimes for patients to breathe, especially when they're having allergic reaction or sinus problems. Thank you, Laura. Uh, if there, if anybody has any follow up, I'll put in the chat um, the ability to to reach out to Laura via email. If you have a follow up, or you can obviously ask follow ups here in the Q and A session that we're going to answer live for everybody. So another question has come up, uh, Laura. Um, I'm mostly recovered from bronchitis. <clears throat> bronchitis. I use both a nebulizer and an inhaler for two weeks. I no longer have any wheezing. Now just easily exhausted. What are the general limits of using these two medications for his nebulizer? It's um, ipratorpium, hypertropium, hypertropium, bromide. Yep. So excuse me for butchering that. That's okay. Albuterol, albuterol sulfate inhal right. inhalation solution. Right. For the inhaler, it's albuterol sulfate inhalate, um, inhalatoine aerosol. So, so here's the deal. Albuterol is what we call the rescue inhaler. That's the bronchodilator that if you're in trouble and you're having trouble breathing, that's the one we want you to take. So that's fine. I would always have that inhaler handy. As far as the ipitropium bromide albuterol mix, they do mix the two together because they're both bronchodilators. One's long acting, one's, fat, one's fast acting, and one's long lasting. So you get the, the benefit of both. Um, if your doctor only wants you to take it for two weeks post um, bronchitis, then I, but if you're still having breathing issues where you feel like you still can't get enough air, if it's not weather related, and even if it is, you probably should have a conversation with your physician because you may need to go a little bit longer with the meds, but I don't like to violate anybody's prescription because I don't know you and I don't know what they prescribed it for. If you have any other underlying conditions that could make this flare up more frequently, but yes, I would, I would, if you, there's no long-term effects of taking those medications. We have patients that take those medications years and years and years and years. It's not and even oral, even inhaled steroids. People think of steroids. We're not talking about one that you swallow and goes through your whole system. We're talking about one that you inhale and it sits on the smooth muscle of your airway. Very good. Uh, we hope that answers your question again. Um, we'll put in the chat um, mm -hmm. that in here. Um, Your email address there, Laura, just in case anybody has follow up. Mm -hmm. So we have another question. Sure. The question is, I've been diagnosed with asthma and emphysema. I was told I should use the mouthpiece rather than the mask because I will get more medication in my lungs when nebulizing. However, when I use the mouthpiece, it makes me cough a lot for most of the treatment, at least five to six minutes. But when I use the mask, I can sit calmly and breathe for 10 minutes without coughing unless I start breathing through my mouth. So any help for... for um... So my question would be to, to this person, if you're getting relief, it, it is true that using a mouthpiece, you are going to get more medication. Because think about it, the mask is on your face and that aerosol is also hitting your face. So you're getting some medication deposit on your face and not as much in your airway. So my question would be, if the mask is working for this person and they're getting benefit from it, even if they're not getting all the medication, but they feel better, I would take it that way. Do you have patients that take it via mouthpiece and it does make them cough? That's, I mean, we want you to be able to cough to get a phlegm, but not have a coughing fit when you break a rib or now you're really short of breath and you're kind of, it's, what it does is it increases the more you cough, the more inflammation that you're getting, the more mucus. So my recommendation, even though it is a better treatment with the mouthpieces, I would use the mask because it sounds like you're benefiting when you use the mask. You sit there calmly, you're getting enough medication not to feel short of breath or wheeze, but you're not, but it's not going in there the way that the mouthpiece is and really stimulate in your airway 
to produce more mucus and get more inflamed. So I would stick with the mask. Um, if you're not benefiting using the mask and you're still coughing with that mouthpiece, you have to talk to the doctor. They may want to change the medication. Hopefully that answers answers that question. Again, we're always here if there's some follow-up needed, but again, um, we hope that uh, was helpful. And uh, one more question here. Um, can you discuss when to do NEV treatment when the doctor orders it PRN? PRN, you know, it means as needed. So it depends, if the doctor ordered a PRN NEV treatment, it has to be an albuterol or pro-air, which is a form of albuterol sulfate. Albuterol sulfate, again, is our rescue inhaler. So when your doctor orders a PRN, it's when you have that tickle in your throat where it feels like it's gonna close up, when you feel like you're wheezing or you can hear your wheeze. Sometimes you have an audible wheeze, you can actually hear that little wheeze coming out of you. When you have that real heaviness in your chest or you're having a hard time breathing, I'm an asthmatic. So when I take a treatment, I took one right before I did this video because this air is really bothering me. And I was coughing a lot and bringing up a lot of uh, mucus. So the treatments are going to help. Yeah, just stick with them and take the, like I said, the albuterol is made to um, be used for mostly PRN. So if you're having a tough day, use it. Make sure you do as many puffs as it's been scheduled to. It's usually two puffs and then wait in between puffs a couple of seconds. Make sure you shake that canister up really good if you're using an inhaler, you know, that kind of stuff. You don't have to rinse your mouth with the albuterol, but the albuterol is designed to keep you from having those really bad incidents. So if you feel it coming on, and that's what we try to teach people is what is my trigger? How do I know I don't feel good you could tell you know you start to get that weird feeling in your throat like you can't can't swallow you can't breathe well you know you're starting to get that sing-songy air flowing in and out because you're wheezing that's when you need to take your treatment that's what they mean by prn as you need it and it can be done in the middle of the night if you wake up in the middle of the night and you're having a an episode where you can't breathe definitely take your treatment doesn't matter what time of the day thank you for that laura well, if there's no other questions, um, we've, uh, oh, it looks like we've got one more in here. Yeah, very good. So another question. Hi there, can nebulizers be used as a preventative measure with diluted food grade peroxide for lung health? No. Indicate this as a preventative treatment? If so, how often? I have a friend who is doing so and she claims she breathes so much easier and feels better than just a few minutes. Thanks. Obviously, I've never heard of anybody taking um, aerosolized peroxide. I could never recommend something that I've never even heard of. So whether this person is having benefit or not, I don't know what it's doing to their lungs. It's not a normal um, compound that we put in any medication. I've never seen peroxide. Now, you know, there's there's homeopathic and holistic physicians or people that do this. I This is not something that's medically tested that I know of. I've never heard of peroxide being used as an inhaler. So my question would be, you need to have a discussion with an MD or somebody that, that's medically trained and to find out what this compound will do and if it's okay for you, just because someone else uses it. That's the same thing. You know, someone else, obviously you, you, you can't take insulin unless you're diabetic. I wouldn't be taking, there's no prophylactic. The only thing that's prophylactic is the steroid and it'll only be prescribed if you already have some sort of issue with your airway, but to take anything over the counter. And I would even stay away from like primatine mist and all those over the counter drugs because all they are is adrenaline. They're not medications that we know that do the trick. They're for instant relief, but they can be dangerous if you overuse them. Okay, very good. Um, hopefully that answers your question out there. We, we appreciate you asking. Um, the next question is, does the O2 provider Typical, typically provide the replacement nebulizer tubing and mouthpieces? Normally, um, your your durable medical equipment company will provide those, but you know, every, a lot of things have changed. Um, guidelines change, reimbursement changes. So if the patient is already getting oxygen from this company, what they should do is call up and say, do you carry NEV supplies? If not, call someone like us that does, that you know you can order right online, it'll be at your house the next day. Right, is it uh, or same day service for our neb stuff? Yeah, on shop, on shop yeah. nebulizer. Yep, yeah. anything on there. 
Yeah. So I can't, I can't speak. I used to work for a durable medical equipment company and yes, we did supply nebulizer stuff, but if they weren't a client of ours, they'd be, it was a cash and carry business anyway. So, but if you're on oxygen, I would inquire with your durable medical equipment company. They probably are carrying those products. Very good. Any other questions out there, folks? Tap into uh, Laura's uh, experience and wisdom there. Give you another minute. Here's another one. Um, I have COPD for over 30 years. I use nebulizer with um, ipratropium. Yep. Ipratropium, albuterol plus albuterol rescue inhaler. The rescue seems to give much better relief. Why would that be? Well, you're getting all the you're getting pure albuterol. The other one is a mix. It's ipratropium and albuterol, and one, like I said, is long lasting. It's not the epitropium is a long lasting drug. It's not instant. So you're not so with the albuterol you're getting, the only drug you're getting is the one that acts immediately, instantaneously. You inhale it, it sits on the smooth muscle and it dilates it. With the epitropium mixed in it, you're only getting half albuterol, which is the one that dilates. And then you're getting one that lasts longer through the duration of the treatment. So for a re if you're having problems breathing, whoever asked this question, my my vote would be go directly to your albuterol inhaler and use your ipotropium and albuterol or your mix, you know, for your regular treatments. But if you're having a difficult time breathing, go directly for your albuterol. That's where you're going to get the most relief. And the reason you're getting the most relief is because it's all one drug. The other one is two drugs mixed and one's not fast acting. So you're getting half of the amount of butyrol, albuterol that you would get in a normal, in, you know, dose of just albuterol. Very good. Give everybody another minute or so to ask any other questions. Really appreciate all the questions. Hopefully. Yeah, this was great. Yeah. Hopefully the answers have been helpful. Just be on the lookout for your kids. There's a lot of RSV around, which is the respiratory syncytial virus. It's early this year. It usually comes out in late fall and winter, but you're having it all summer. So We've seen a lot of kids get hospitalized for it, and we've seen a lot of nebulizer treatments for viruses like that as well. Eight. As always, we're, uh, health products for you, Shop Nebulizer, we're available um, uh, all throughout the day. Um, you can reach us in a variety of ways via our websites. Uh, again, healthproductsforyou.com. We, we use the short form hpfy.com just as a vernacular, but um, uh, as well as our shopnebulizer.com website, always available. If there's anything that you need, you can reach out to us there. Laura's email address is available. Um, so we welcome uh, any any questions, concerns you may have, please reach out to us. Again, if, if you have any um, recommendations for future topics, maybe a, a respiratory issue that uh, you have dealt with, maybe we can add that into our future. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we want to be as responsive as possible to, to all you who um, are shopping with us and, and reaching out to us as a part of the care continuum that uh, Health Products For You is, is a part of. So if there's nothing else, um, no other questions, we'll, uh, we'll go ahead and let everybody get back to their day. Again, thank you very much, Laura. Thank you. And thank you for everybody. Those were great questions. I think that um, a lot of people ask some great questions. Yeah, great questions today. Yeah, fantastic. Okay, everyone, have a great day.